Dean, um, you've been in the industry to see a, an incredible curve in terms of the technology and the development of it. And I'm kind of guessing you would have started at a time where people were drawing yes. the ideas. Yep. And people have now returned to drawing, albeit mm -hmm. in a very different way. So you, you started in analog, you've gone back to digital analog, analog let's say. Um, in terms of a day-to-day -day working, both you as a director working with the artists and the artists, the animators themselves, even within the two films, the How to Train Your Dragon films, can you talk about just the ease and the difference it's made? Yeah, I, well, certainly there was, for, for any animator going from a hand-drawn background um, and, and moving into computer animation, they had to learn to interpret all of their instincts in a very, uh, very counterintuitive way. Uh, so, you know, in, instead of being able to work with their hands, they were suddenly in this position where everything had to be interpreted by, uh, you know, selecting, selecting aspects, selecting an eyebrow, inputting an, uh, a degree of arch, waiting for that to render. Oh, that's too much, you know, reduce that. Everything was so laborious. I mean, t to my eye, it looked, it looked really, really difficult. And they still managed to get beautiful, subtle animation out of it. But given the tool of being able to, to, to return to a stylus in hand, and to manipulate the character and see live results, real-time results, uh, it it uh, it took a very the the, the learning curve <laughs> was was you know uh, just a matter of a couple of weeks, and they were proficient with the tool, and it just was so freeing for everybody, and it was very freeing for me because it meant that we could meet more often, we could discuss the the nuances of performance in greater detail, and um, all of that could be accomplished without without having the animation take that much longer. So within the same, the same amount of time, and in fact, in many cases, less time, an animator could take a shot between a couple of characters and reach a level of, of uh, nuance and subtlety that just wasn't possible before. Add to that that the, the uh, new software allows us to have more complex rigs and more controls, both visible and under the skin, meant that they could go much further with the subtlety of expression as well. So I, I've loved that because uh, coming from a background of hand-drawn animation where subtle, subtle expression was always problematic because lines, the, the more you slowed down a character, the more the lines would boil on screen. And when projected on a large screen, you could see it moving all over the place. We, we have the ability to go to some very quiet moments and very powerful interactions between characters with great ease. I really like that it, it has become something that is intuitive again. How does your, actually, your actual thought process as a writer now, with the knowledge that you can create things that perhaps you couldn't before, how has that impacted your role as a writer? It's phenomenal. It's, you know, <laughs> I think they, we often talk about creativity and, and when things are wide open, it can almost be a curse. Yeah. If anything's possible, it, you don't know where to start. and. I appreciate having certain fence posts put in place. Um, if, I, if I know that I have limitations, then it's easier, it's easier to be creative within those limitations. But the reality is there is no image we cannot create now. It's just a matter of time and, and budget. Uh, so that, that definitely frees, frees me up uh, at this point, you know, thinking about Dragon 3 and, and what sort of images we can create. Uh, I don't feel held back at all. I no longer feel held back by the limitations of animation as a medium either, uh, because we've, we've seen that live action can incorporate so much of, of photoreal animation into its process and it's, it's uh, getting to the point where it's indistinguishable from what's been filmed. Uh, likewise with animation, there's nothing, there's nothing holding us back from making a film that speaks to a broad audience. And uh, so I, I, I really don't, I think animation is such a powerful medium and I'm not one of the people that, that subscribe to the belief that it's purely for kids. I, I always write to, to appease the young members of the audience, but also to entertain myself as well, and, and hopefully all of the adults that will be present. So I, th I think it, it, there is great room for, uh, you know, for, for originality, uh, for spectacular imagery that's never been seen before, and, and it, it really is only restrained by as as limited as our imaginations are at this point. 
I, I know some people who believe that children are only created to justify adults going to see animated films. <laughs> so just take the kid along, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to watch it. Um, I, I talked about in the introduction that the 1980s to a degree was a dearth of um, mm. animated features. Since then, there have been many different um, remarkable organizations producing animated features. I'm curious about the level of competition. Mm. Um, obviously, creatively, it, everything's under wraps. But in terms of technology, Lincoln, uh, is there sharing or the, how does that work? I think, um, I mean, there's a fair amount of movement between the studios at the engineering level. Um, and there are forums like conferences. The graphs is still going. And so it's a, it's a sort of pillar of the um, uh, uh, computer graphics uh, industry. Um, that there's, there's a fair, quite a lot of uh, cooperation. For example, we, um, we cooperate on standards, um, contribute uh, solutions to those standards, whether that's um, a standard led by Pixar right now, the open uh, subdiv, or putting a standard like OpenVDB into the environment. It helps us because it means that um, companies that build tools, like the Foundry based in London, side effects, Autodesk, um, Adobe, and so on, can do the work to integrate those standards into the tools, and then we consume those tools back, so we don't actually have to do that work ourselves. So there's actually some self-interest in making certain types of technology available to the wider industry, and that's been a, uh, a, a trend actually pioneered by Sony uh, Imageworks and uh, picked up essentially by all of the major animation studios and many of the visual effects studios. Um, so in that sense, it's pretty cooperative, though not collaborative. We are obviously, to some extent, trying to create opportunities for our filmmakers to do something unique. But ultimately, when it comes to competition, it's about the stories. It's about the film, films themselves. The technology helps you maybe compete commercially and in terms of cost, and sometimes can actually take you to a new type of medium, which we believe the animation capability here really does. Um, but... Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cooperative, I would say. Again, you mentioned something there that's also touched on what you said, Dean. There's always been that, that conflict, to a degree, in, in special effects over look what we can do, as opposed to not necessarily whether we should do it, but is it what you need? Mm. Well, well, this is why I wanted to make that contrast, perhaps in, in, in slightly hokey terms, in terms of between yang and yin. I mean, the yang is like, it's the look at me, look what I can do. In a, in a particular, we do that as well. I mean, there are sequences in Dragons that are hero effects where you put a lot of resource, a lot of um, uh, uh, creative talent in to create a spectacular. The, the world of beasts coming out of the water was one of those. Um, uh, but that's a that's a t that's a technique, and it's 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 very brash. But it can also be quite limited. I'm I'm much more excited by the the stuff you don't see and the the efficiency of getting. Um, that creative dialogue realized and the opportunities basically that come to mind immediately realized in the media, that is much harder to achieve across these types of productions. And when you do so, then the whole product becomes just spectacularly better. And, and that's the big step, I think. I, you know, yes, there's great effects, and yes, these are, these are larger than ever and, and so on, but the, the, it's, that's, it's that quiet stuff that really is really important. And anybody working in visual effects knows the complexity of dealing with this digital data is enormous. I, I like the way that you both talk about acting and, and specific reference to the characters. There's that great line by Hitchcock where he said, Walt Disney has all the best casting. If he doesn't like an actor, he can just tear him up. Um, but <laughs> what, what I, I, I find quite interesting about that is, is the way that you employ actors. If it's changed in terms of the voices, of at what point they come in, is it different to what, what's been done in the past with animated film? But also, you, you both emphasized movement earlier, mm -hmm. and could you talk a little bit more about the way that you create such human movement? Yeah, I, well, you know, I, I believe that uh, the, the casting for these films, my, my particular sensibility is not a very cartoony one. So uh, I think a lot of the actors, when they first come in for auditions, they tend to ham it up and they, they overact, thinking that that's, well, I'm, I'm acting in a cartoon, I should be really broad and everything should be funny. And, and I'm, I'm always encouraging our actors to, to go to a place of just honesty, you know, truth. And um, I love it when we can bring actors together 
in the same room and, and mic them across from each other and allow them to step on each other's lines or veer off script and, and develop a scene according to their understanding of, of their characters. Uh, because it, it is probably the only spontaneity that we have in animation. It's the only thing that feels uh, truly authentic and real. And we have cameras capturing the, the recording process as well. And, and that's a great reference for the animators because they might see a little detail, a mannerism, a tick that they, they want to adopt into their animation. Um, it's not to say that they, they follow anything slavishly in terms of live action reference, but um, it, these are all ideas and uh, oftentimes it's the, the, the most subtle little, little flinch or, or facial tick that creates uh, a bit of character that's, that might not be noticeable, but I think the, the cumulative effect is really strong. So really what this, the, the advances in the technology have allowed us to go to a place where the acting is that much more believable. The characters feel that much more real because they are not exaggerating. And animation is, is, is always, you know, I think, I think the difference between performance capture and the, that, that kind of uncanny valley of photorealistic uh, motion capture animation and what we do is that we, we know where to exaggerate and, and where to pull back. So you're never kind of caught in the divide between this, this is hyper real and yet there's something just off, there's something a little dead in the eyes. We're always looking for those, um, those, those mannerisms that we can incorporate into uh, you know, a, a, an original animated performance that has a breath of life in it. And what's it like working with the actors who you, you've directed before, having them come back having seen their alter ego on screen and having to deliver again, albeit older? It, you know, it's really interesting because they, a lot of them don't see the finished product until it's done. So I was at the Cannes Film Festival for our world premiere and I was seated beside um, America Ferreira and Jay Baruchel and then I had Kate Blanchett on this side and, and a lot of them, they, they were seeing it for the first time and so they were giggling and whispering to themselves and I had the experience of watching Hiccup and Astrid and hearing Hiccup and Astrid <laughs> buzzing in my ear. Uh, but I, I think they're, they are astounded at how much, uh, how, how, how convincing and how how believable those performances are. And they may not be acted in the way that they would, you know, they don't recognize the mannerisms, it's not how they would have performed it physically in a lot of cases, but they they wholeheartedly believe in the character and uh, I think it's a, a marvel to them.